first of all, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for attending today. The um, I'm going to jump right in, and the aquatic insect order known as Odonata, which includes the two suborders of dragonflies and damselflies, has great cultural appeal virtually worldwide. The adults are often bright and demonstrative, and they can easily draw your attention away as you are otherwise engaged in the field birding or herping or lepping or even boating and fishing. But the fact is that these adults represent just a very short-lived stage in the life cycle of odonates. So for over the, over the past decade or so, I have rather concentrated on their somewhat less showy, but perhaps even more significant aquatic stage, which is called their nymphal stage. Or um, as you can see, there's a couple of images on this slide that represent dragonfly nymphs. And it's actually in this nymphal stage where they spend by far the majority of their time and ontogeny. And it's this stage which inextricably ties them to their aquatic ecosystem or niche. So my goal today is to highlight the need for better understanding of this stage and using the stage to monitor in addition to adults as a means of informing more meaningful conservation and or restoration efforts. So let's, let's begin first by asking the question, why conserve dragonflies? Why, why should we care about dragonflies? And the first answer is they are an amazing evolutionary success story. True dragonflies developed in the early Permian about 270 million years ago. And, for, and, and suffice it to say that the planet Earth has not been able to toss some challenge to this group of insects that they have not been able to over, overcome. And as such, they are regularly used for evolutionary theory modeling and systematics. So they, they, they are important in the research end of evolution, but they are also significant in their roles in food webs, both aquatic and terrestrial food webs. Dragonflies and damselflies are carnivorous in both the adult and the nymphal stage. And um, they are voracious predators. They consume all manner of invertebrates and sometimes surprisingly even vertebrates in these stages. The nymphs feed at higher and higher trophic levels as they grow and develop underwater. And they actually in some aquatic habitats are top predators. As top predators, in waterways, they're really good at pest control. Dragonfly nymphs eat massive numbers of mosquito larvae. A single adult dragonfly can take out upwards to 200 mosquitoes a day. And I'll tell you, if you've ever been hiking in the Northwoods in June and those deer fly are attacking you, it's so nice to have a circling swarm of dragonflies above them dive bombing and taking them out. But in addition to being predators, they are also prey. And a rich odonate fauna can really um, support the, the, the food sources of waterfowl and other birds, frogs, and fishes. Dragonflies are excellent aquatic habitat indicators. But I'm going to qualify that statement as the talk continues. Because in, in truth, what they are is they're wonderful indicators of the physical characteristics of both lentic and lotic systems. So I'm not going to speak about chemical pollution and dragonflies. Any order of insects has, um, has a wide variety of, of ranges of environmental susceptibilities. And so there are dragonflies that are that are undoubtedly high, susceptible to chemical pollutants and some probably a lot that are not. So um, that jury is still out. There's a lot of research that needs to be done on chemical pollutants and dragonfly nymphs to figure out what the effects are. But I can tell you things like Roundup, glyphosate, 
we find sometimes that the zygopterin or damselfly population in pools that have been denuded of herps because of Roundup actually explode. So we, um, we've got that range of weedy species and highly sensitive niche species. And we'll talk more about that, but the, the niches that we're going to look at are more about the physical characteristics of the waterways and conservation needs to, um, for the most part for dragonflies, concern itself with maintaining the original physical um, uh, parameters of the aquatic habitats that these are, are evolved in. I do wanna say that there isn't a freshwater habitat in the world in which you can't find some nymphal assemblage of dragonfly species. They are everywhere. And it, it can be something like the central cup of a bromeliad where you find dragonfly and damselfly nymphs going through their entire immature state in a tropical rainforest. Or it can, there's, there's even some, there's three species in North America that can grow in saline environments, somewhat brackish water along the coast. As I'm talking about freshwater environments, I, I'm thinking about a couple of years ago, I was on the border with Nicaragua in a virgin rainforest. And the year before they'd had an extreme weather event and trees had fallen and the government had allowed the timber industry to go in and remove trees. And of course they removed more than damaged trees, but the truck tires left little impressions, deep and not deep impressions, but shallow impressions on the forest floor. So I went in and I was, I was doing some oating as it were. And I came upon one of these truck depressions. It was only a couple of feet long. I saw some ovipositing dragonflies in that. I scooped with my dip net and I pulled out six species of final instar nymphs and many, many, early instar nymphs from that truck tread. Um, so we know that we, we can change and sometimes offer new habitats to, to dragonflies and they're gonna move in and colonize. Again, we'll discuss that behavior later in the talk. Finally, why should we care? Dragonflies are incredible models for engineering and biomedical engineering. Everything from informing calculations on aeronautics in the space industry to the development of antimicrobial materials in healthcare. So we, we can use information from this order of insects in multiple industries. I want to say that, that um, to begin monitoring or conserving a group of organisms without first having some sense or good degree of knowledge as to their natural history is always going to be at the very least folly and at the very worst detrimental to that organism and pot potentially others, as we all know. So let's get started by taking a look at some of the Odonata natural history that is going to allow us to inf uh, be better versed so that we can affect conservation. First of all, dragonflies are not holometabolous insects like butterflies, which go through a four stage metamorphosis in their life cycle that includes a larval and a pupil stage. Dragonflies are hemimetabolous, which means they have only three stages to their life cycle, the egg, the nymph, and the imago, or the adult. I'd like to get a general sense as to how long they spend in each of these stage, stages before we get started. So these eggs here that you see, um, once they are oviposited into a water, although some are um, oviposited above water, of course, but they take anywhere from, on average, one to three weeks to hatch. And there's exceptions to every generality I use in this talk. But that one to three weeks is average. They hatch into an early instar nymph, and it goes through about anywhere from about 11 to 15 molts and growth stages, you know, called instars. This can take a few months in the case of some species of libellulids or skimmers, up to multiple years in the case of gonfids or club tails. In Northern Illinois, I would guess that it's somewhere on the average would be probably a year to two years. The nymph, when it's finally ready to emerge, comes out, crawls out on a perch and 
it closes as the imago or adult. The adult, it's gonna live maybe four to six weeks, dependent on weather conditions or events and predation. So right off the bat, we gotta say to ourselves, the nymph is the thing. So on this screen, whoops, I went a little too crazy with the clicker. On this screen, we have egg, an egg, an egg of Hagenius brevistylus, the dragon hunter. And I rear dragonflies out in my lab from the egg stage and I photograph them along the way. So you can see that this egg right here, it has just been laid. It's going through embryology and in a couple of weeks, what emerges is a nymph. It, some people call it a pro-nymph, but it is actually the first instar nymph. And it immediately, within minutes of hatching, undergoes its first molt into this second instar nymph. Now I can tell you this, this nymph, when I photographed it, was about 1.5 millimeters long. So it has a lot of growing to do. And as I mentioned, its jaws are not big enough to feed on, on large prey. So the prey items are going to range from protozoa, only living animals, is it, or um, uh, protozoa, only living prey is it ever going to eat. But as it grows, it is going to feed at higher and higher levels. And on this screen, you're seeing the exact same species, three different size cohorts or instars. Here's the smallest, it does not have wing buds yet. Here is the uh, middle one, it's starting to develop some wing buds. These three right here are what we call final instar or F minus zero nymphs. And you can see their wings are fully, are, are, they're, they're, they're as full as they're gonna develop in the, wing, in the nymphal stage. And this is why, you have to bear in mind, these are not larvae, they are not pupae. They're almost a combination of both. They go through all of that as nymphs during this development. Before I move on to the next stage, I wanna mention that at this state in the final instar, they may overwinter or they may be getting ready to emerge in, in a few days. They will stop eating when they're getting ready to emerge. Their wing pads will swell up. And in I'd say two to five days, they're gonna crawl out of the water and emerge as an adult. Now, the, the next slide, I want you to look at the abdomens on these final instars. And here is Hagenius situated next to a hawthorn leaf, which is one of the leaves that I find it living under at the edges of large, well-oxygenated lakes up in northern Wisconsin and at the edges of rivers where there's a lot of wave action and there's a lot of trash develop, a lot of detritus. These dragon hunter nymphs are leaf mimics. mimics. They're stenaceous. They're incredibly niched in this detritus at the edge um, of, a, of a current. And this is a dip net from a river that I took up there. And I don't know whether you can tell it or not, but there's actually three dragon hunter final instar nymphs in this trash, this leaf litter and bark. And they're hidden quite well. They're incredibly cryptic. Here's the third one. So my point is that if you were to take a Hagenius nymph and put it on a sandy bottom in an aquarium, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb and it's going to struggle because it is evolved in that niche. When we look Here's that same species. It has crawled up out of the water onto a perch. It is emerging out, breaking through its dorsum just like a cicada, leaving behind this shed skin. Uh, shed skin. And this is called an exuvi. Exuvi is both singular and plural in this case, kind of a unique Latin situation. But, um, but this shed skin or exuvi is going to be important when we talk about monitoring. And then here, of course, is the teneral adult, which teneral means it's going to take a while to flesh out its wings, pump out the, the abdomen, and then dry out before it can move far from its birth pond or waterway. Eventually, this is the adult, in this case, one of the largest dragonflies in North America, very bulky. 
So from this discussion so far, what I want to summarize is that it is in the nymphal state with the aquatic stressors of the environment that that dragonfly evolution has has really resulted in allowing dragonflies to exist and continue on. And when you look at this screen, this is a montage I compiled of the 10 families of dragonflies and damselflies in Illinois. I've chosen an individual from each family just to highlight the diversity of their habitus or body type. And you can see that the abdomens, for example, take on different shapes, different angles, even their caudal appendages here at the end vary greatly. The length of the legs is quite different. The shape of the head, you can't see it from this picture, but even their antennal segments are variable between families. And as with any order or family or genus within that taxonomic group, there's, there's even more derived traits and, um, and morphological variation. So this is just a general view of some functional morpho morphological characters. I want to talk now in Odinate um, Natural History about functional morphology of that nymph stage and have a look at how dragonfly nymphs exist and why they exist based on their structures in specific aquatic habitats. To start with, um, I'm going to show you a little video of me nymphing in a central Illinois river called the Emberus River in the Grand Prairie belly of Illinois, where everything has been scoured flat by glaciation. Um, and there's lots of sand and gravel in those flattened rivers there. There's also an incredible amount of atrazine and farm chemicals in this buckle on the, on the corn belt in the very belly of Illinois. But there is a species of dragonfly there called co the common sand dragon or Progomphus obscurus. And it's there for very good reason. It has evolved into a specific niche of shallow, lighted, illuminated water along sandy shoals and sandbars in clean sand. And that's really odd because most of the time, we find dragonfly nymphs requiring a little bit of organic material in the substrate where we find them. But the sand dragon is the only dragonfly you are ever gonna see in this shallow sandy edge by the sandbar. And I want you to notice, do you see these trails? Those trails are tunnels. And those tunnels are made by this dragonfly nymph, see them all? And if you go and you scoop down at the end of one, you know, every couple of scoops, you're gonna find a sand dragon nymph. Let's see if I can go to the end of this trail. And I think I find it here, here it is. Whoop, there's the nymph. That nymph, look at that body. It just looks worm-like, doesn't it? It, it has a, a shovel shaped head, it's got an accumulate, tapered body. It, it has short legs for digging, we'll see in a second. It just wants to, to tunnel through this coarse sand. Not a lot of dragonfly nymphs can do that, none but this guy. Watch how he buries himself immediately. He goes under, he's happy in this environment, and he has no other competition. On this, I, I took one out and I put it on the hood of my car to videotape this for you guys to show how he's He's burrowing very quickly, effectively getting under. He leaves his anal pyramid there. You see him blow out some water. They actually breathe through their rectum. So, wow, that's a pretty specific niche. All right, here's that, here's that nymph. And that nymph right off the bat, they're one of the most beautiful nymphs we have in North America. Look at that modeling. It disappears on the sand as soon as it hits the sand. And certainly if it's burrowed under, it's, it's not gonna be recognizable. In addition, look at the forelegs. You see how, how short they are? They are laterally compressed in their ephemera and the tibia, and they, they um, 
form keels, basically. They are scooped and they have burrowing hooks and they just dig so rapidly. And of course, here's the snow plow head, like a wedge. It has a long tapering abdomen that, that helps it move stealthily through that, that tunnel it's digging. And even the final, the, the, the later instars that have the wing buds, their wing buds are divergent, not sitting on top like so many dragonflies so that it can move smoothly through that tunnel. So that's pretty niched. I want to take a look now at some general categories of nymphs and, and some of their life histories based on how they position themselves in the column of water or substrate beneath the water column in their chosen aquatic habitats. We can categorize nymphs into three general classes, but don't get me wrong, these are not taxonomic groups. They're just lifestyles that we find them in. They are burrowers, climbers or clingers and sprawlers. So those are the three groups we're gonna look at and take a look at their anatomy and see how it has evolved to support their chosen position in the aquatic habitat. So let's first look at burrowers. Burrowers dig down under the bottom substrate. They hide out there and they lay in wait for prey. Um, club tails for the most part, not all, but most of them are burrowers like this one. And this one lives in Chicagoland. It uh, is what we call a pond club tail. You find it oddly in, in lentic rather than lodic systems, but uh, it has short legs and it has these little hooks here at the end you can see so that it can dig and burrow, cover itself with the, the silt, sand and mud that it lives in. It has a long tapered abdomen with what we find with burrowers is they have elongated caudal segments so they can stick their little rear ends up and breathe out of the substrate. The other uh, second category are the clingers or climbers. And these are going to live and position themselves above the substrate in the water column by grabbing a hold of submerged vegetation and aquatic plants or uh, flotsam and jetsam floating water sog uh, sogged logs and tree branches or roots scoured along a, a, a river bank where they're they're partially submerged so they're going to hang on to those this is a darner nymph um that i i grabbed and i just threw in a glass of water and i they they want to cling because they attach themselves to that aquatic vegetation along the banks and edges and they stalk their prey from there so it is what we call figmotactic. It has this reflex where it just, if it feels anything under its belly, it wraps its legs around, grabs a hold very tight. So I put a pencil in just to keep it happy. It immediately grabbed and hung on. It's got these amazing claws so that um, it, it tries to withstand any kind of force that's going to um, dislodge it. Nonetheless, when you've got clingers and climbers in a, a flowing river or stream, sometimes they get dislodged. And a lot of times they will immediately tighten up and they'll float downstream and they look for all intents and purposes like a, a floating piece of stick or bark. So they're not preyed upon until all of a sudden they bump into something, wrap their arms around it and they got it. So when we look at climbers and clingers, they take on different colors and you'll find yellows and oranges and greens in certain darner nymphs, for example, that, that cling to living aquatic vegetation. This is Boyeria venosa, the fawn darner, and it, it doesn't cling to living vegetation except for tree roots that are submerged. So um, it's, it's not only adapted as a clinger, but the substrate or perch it chooses determined its color dark color and the texture and the texture is a roughened cuticle so it looks like the texture of the bark i put it on a stripped piece here for this image so it doesn't quite blend in as well otherwise you couldn't see what i was talking about here's another example of a clinger this is a somatochlora nymph an emerald nymph and it's not found in illinois but um i pulled these out of bogs and and in sphagnum and they cling to sphagnum as you can see over here this is about the single most perfect cryptic niche 
for this dragonfly. It's abdomen, it's body coloration, perfect for the sphagnum in these acidic bogs. It, it, um, it also, I don't know if you can see from this picture, but it's got just massive amounts of hair. It's the hairiest little fuzzy nymph. And when it is clinging and clutching to sphagnum, you cannot find it, it disappears. The third category are the sprawlers. And sprawling nymphs, right off the bat, you look at a sprawler and you, you think Harry Potter and, and the spider in that, that iconic scene. It, is, it spreads its legs out and it increases its surface area in such a way that it actually can flatten down on top of the surface of the substrate instead of burrowing under and it can hang out there and sprawl or patrol for um, foraging. All macromiids, which are the cruisers, they are sprawlers and they have these enormous legs. When I um, find them, they are sprawled in Illinois rivers and streams in coarser gravel and sand around the eddies, around rocks, even out away from the banks where there's a pretty strong current but they're on top of the substrate and still able to stabilize themselves. They've got long claws, as you can see here, but also they've got incredibly flat bodies. When there's a flash in these waterways, when there's floods and, and rainstorms, they will go tumbling down the river. In, and they may even do this on purpose if they get washed away from their chosen substrate. And they will go head over tails. And I've watched them finally come to a rest on their backs with these long legs. They just immediately tip themselves over like some lunar landing craft and right themselves up and then they sprawl again. And they stay in that position for so long if they find the right substrate that they blend into, that when I take them out of um, Illinois rivers, a lot of times they've just stayed so stationary for so long, they start growing things. They act as a, uh, a, a substrate for other members of the ecosystem like these algae. Okay, so those are the three basic categories in terms of lifestyle, but those lifestyles also inform um, other parts of the nymph anatomy, such as the lower jaw. The lower jaw is a prey catching organ and it's known as the labium. It's pretty spectacular how they feed. But if you look at these seven families of our Illinois dragonflies, you can see in this lower jaw that some are flat, some are scoop shaped. Um, their palps uh, take on different different shapes. And of course, that has a lot to do with the, the biotic community in which they're foraging, as well as whether they're clingers, burrowers, or sprawlers. I mean, when I first pulled my first cordylogastra nymph out, the spike tail, and I held it up and saw these, these jaws here, they, from this, this stream that it was embedded in the mud in, I, I gotta be honest, I thought, I'm going to need a bigger net. They are impressive, but they're also niched. So what other parts of the nymph should we consider in the natural history behind it? When we look at these two extreme body types, I chose the erythemus nymph, the Eastern pond hawk, because it's everywhere in Chicago land. You can't go anywhere in the summer without seeing one of these guys. They cling to milfoil, which we have an awful lot of in our ponds. And usually when I dip them and take them out, they are lime green um, and they fit right in, but they come out and they just look like little Pez candies. If you remember those from childhood, their abdomen is truncate and they cling, their eyes underneath are orange or yellow and they cling and they hang on and they disappear. But this, um, this aphyla nymph here, which does not live in Illinois, it's from the southern states, its abdomen is the exact opposite extreme. It is long, narrow, and it has this elongated 10th abdominal segment. Recall that they breathe out their rectum. It has been suggested, they, you find them in soft mud, which they can burrow in or sink in pretty easily, but then they've got the problem of breathing and getting their anal pyramid out to the surface at the water substrate interface so that they can breathe. Well, it's been suggested that they might use this as a snorkel. 
I'm not sure I believe in that completely. I'd, I'm planning on investigating whether it's used more for directional jet propulsion, um, but uh, but will but it's probably both. When we look at the abdomen on nymphs, some of them are cylindrical. You see that on a lot of clingers, but the sprawlers and the burrowers maintain a very flat abdomen. Also, what you notice is some dragonflies have very smooth abdominal surfaces. Others have all sorts of spines and points coming out like this. These are called mid dorsal spines and these are posterior lateral spines. And I'll tell you what, they look very dissuasive, don't they? They dissuade fish and predators. They certainly dissuade me when I've got a handful of them. So my point there is that many dragonfly species have evolved modifications of their nymph anatomy in order to exist in water systems that have fish. And those that live in fishless waterways don't have these protections. So when we stock ponds and so forth around Chicagoland for sports fishing purposes, Unfortunately, we changed the dragonfly assemblage of species in those waterways. Here's a map which is courtesy of the Illinois Natural History Division or survey, and I'm going to steal it today just to show and highlight the natural divisions in Illinois because what I want to talk about next is how does nymph anatomy and um, natural history play into the distribution of nymphs around our state? We'll look only in the northern half of Illinois to give a few examples of the um, distribution ranges of a, of a handful of Illinois dragonflies. But before I start looking at the distribution of, of dragonfly species in the state of Illinois, I wanna mention that distribution and range maps of species it are primarily for dragonflies they're pro primarily determined by two things, the breadth of that species niche and the dispersal behavior of that species. And those are the two things that really define the overall range for dragonflies. But it's going to be difficult to parse out the difference between distribution of a species in Illinois that is simply the consequence of natural distribution and distribution of species that is the consequence of human disturbance. And that's really what we need to do before we begin conservation. So let's take a look. In the Northeastern Morainal Division of Illinois, we find that there are two populations and only two populations of two sites, one in McHenry County, one in Cook County, of Nanothemus bella, the elfin skimmer. You may have heard of this. It's an adorable dragonfly. It is the second smallest dragonfly in the world, and it's a wasp mimic. So it's pretty impressive in its adult stage. But the nymph ha is, is what is defining the fact that it's even here. It's not uncommon in Northern Wisconsin and other parts of the United States where you find bogs and fens. It, um, it has the need for a groundwater given temperature seeping over limestone, gravel and so forth in calcareous fens. And we have two such fens in Chicagoland that have very small little rooms where this species has sustained itself even to this day. So it's here because of that particular habitat being in northeastern morainal area. If we look on the border with Indiana, there is a really neat species that we find in Illinois. And it is called Tecopteryx thorii. It's the gray petal tail. It is now believed to be one of, if not the oldest species on the planet Earth. And I'm comparing that to horseshoe crabs. It's old. It, they think maybe up to over 100 million years old. But um, it is uncommon in Illinois. And when you find it, you only find it in a couple of seepage areas in the Wabash River Valley area where we've got a really neat unique geology and geography. And these seeps that, that flow out of these bluffs into these ravines, um, how's this nymph? 
the nymph has evolved out of the water. It does not develop under the water. It moves up out into the sphagnum and under the oak leaves, the wet, moist oak leaves in that soil that you find at the edges of the seep. So that's pretty, pretty unique. We should not expect to try and develop such a habitat in Chicagoland. It's, it's not going to work and it, doesn't, it, it never belongs there. If we look over here on the Western Central and all the way up to the Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, Iowa border, we have a species of Neurocordulia. Neurocordulia is a genus of shadow dragons. Shadow dragons are um, an interesting genus because the adults fly for only about 20 to 45 minutes a day at dusk. So on a summer June evening at about 8.30, if you go out to a large fast flowing river near Riffles, you may see this, this species flying not in Chicagoland, but out near the, Ohio, uh, the Mississippi and the Ohio. So the Western edge and Southern edge, you're gonna see Neurocordulia species. The reason they don't count much on any of our state tallies is because people don't go out at 8.30 at night along an edge of a large river at the, the riffles and look in the shadows for their shadow or silhouette on the water surface as the moon shines on it. So we don't have a lot of counts from an adult perspective on this, but the nymphs are to be found there. And lastly, just as an example, our Pedogonphus designatus is um, the Eastern ringtail. It's absolutely gorgeous adult dragonfly. It's the only member of this genus we find in Illinois, and we find it as far north as Will County. And, and um, it's, it is a dragonfly that is, is known from the Grand Prairie area of Illinois. It's, I've seen it many times in Illinois, but I've never until this November been able to find the nymph and find its habitat in Illinois. I found it in November in the Mizan River, and I found it in a very specific um, sand, silt, and mud area that was accumulating around fallen logs and um, at an unchanneled section of the, the river. And of course, in those channeled areas of the agricultural belt, you um, just get scouring of banks and you don't get those nice sandy regions, sandy, uh, silty regions. So it's neat because now that I know where, it's it, where it is in Illinois, I can keep an eye on it. And then just to finish this up, I wanted to show you that sometimes dragonfly nymphs can look almost identical. These two, Basiatia and Boyeria, look almost identical. However, and they're both clingers and climbers, but it's interesting because Basiatia, the springtime darner, it, it likes to cling to living vegetation, richly vegetated edges of streams and rivers, whereas Boyeria venosa, the fawn darner, prefers scoured out banks where there are tree roots partially submerged. So when we look at their maps, and, and what we're seeing here is a map from Odonata Central, which is a clearinghouse for um, all citizen science that wants to um, submit pictures. Right now, they, the problem is they only do adults. And, um, and so you can go on Odonata Central and you can get range maps for all of our Illinois dragonflies, which is very fun to look at and compare. And if you look at the fawn darner, I'm sorry, if you look at the springtime darner here, what you're seeing in blue and green, these are sightings in the last 50 years. If you see anything in orange, those are historically known sites, whether they exist now or not, we don't know. But if you look at the springtime darner here in Illinois, we're finding it again along that eastern border with Indiana. But if you look at the map for the very similarly shaped fawn darner, we find it in the Grand Prairie area. And the reason this is orange here isn't because I don't find it there all the time. Um, I, it, I do, and I need to submit dragonfly adult pictures, but I don't do that anymore. These, it's everywhere here. And so why is it capable of colonizing this area of Illinois and springtime darner, which looks so similar, can only colonize this region on the border? And again, it has to do with when you get into that Grand Prairie area, you do not have well-vegetated stream and riverbanks at all. 
Okay, so what are, in summary, our natural history considerations to begin conservation practices? You gotta figure out the physical features of the aquatic habitat and the breeding locations, such as the bottom substrate really plays a big role. It plays a big role in telling a female where to oviposit. It plays a big role in the ontogeny of the nymph. Aquatic and subaquatic vegetation structure, what are the needs there? We know we need to maintain better aquatic and subaquatic or emergent vegetation, especially around Chicagoland in, in even, even so much as up to the, the drainage ditches, retention ponds behind housing communities, et cetera. We need to be informed about the aquatic biotic community. What, what is or isn't present that allows or disallows a dragonfly nymph of a certain species to exist in that waterway. And finally, Voltanism, which I haven't talked about, but we always need to know um, the emergence dates for any given dragonfly species. We need to know how many broods a year does it have? Is it univoltine? Is it semivoltine? Is it bivoltine? Is it partyvoltine? That's really important in informing conservation and certainly monitoring. And the emergence pattern, by emergence pattern, I mean, when does it emerge? Is it a spring emerger? Is it a fall emerger? Somewhere in the summer, is it continuously emerging through, through the year? There's all spectrum of dragonfly species in Illinois that have different differing emergence patterns. How does it emerge? Does it emerge in a rock that is just sticking out of water but still submerged or does it crawl 30 yards out into the woods and climb up a tree like many cruisers and emerge from there? So we we need to know what it's per, what their perches are that they they require. We need to know this for some very good reasons because when we are doing things like opening weirs and and increasing the volume of water in some wetland or or stream, it may if it's done at the wrong time, just inundate emerging a synchronously emerging species and that population has crashed for the year. Another example of that, unfortunately, is motorboats. Motorboats just fly down the Fox River where I live in, in the springtime. Nothing, no, no gaunted club tail that is trying to emerge synchronously at that time, a few inches from the water's edge is gonna make it. They are going to be just slathered with water and while their wings are wet, they, they, they can't do anything. It's, it's just a complete population collapse. So now let's talk about monitoring and then conservation. So one of the first things obviously we need to do before conservation begins is monitoring. And we do monitoring in Illinois, we do monitoring in Wisconsin. Um, so far in the United States, monitoring has only involved adults. And there are some cha challenges with simply monitoring adults. Because when, when you're monitoring adults, it makes it difficult sometimes to make certain um, really concrete conclusions or draw conclusions from what look like obvious assumptions, but may not be. We need to determine with dragonfly monitoring site residency. We need to know, is this a successful breeding site? By successful breeding site, I don't mean just that females are ovipositing there, but that those eggs are hatching underwater. Not that you can just find nymphs there, but that those nymphs have gone through all 12, 13 molts and they have eclosed as adults. So you need to know, is it a successful site? We need to determine when we see a dragonfly, is it just migrating? Dragonflies migrate. We have over a dozen species in the US that, that we know are migrants, but there are many, many more that migrate, maybe, maybe not all the way to Florida, but they migrate to, to some degree, and what is their dispersal behavior? So when you see something um, like the comet darner fly over a pond, we record it on our sheets, we say, ha ha, the comet darner is at this site, but is it really? That one has a really specific niche for its nymph, and it's a strong flyer and flies miles and miles and miles and miles looking for proper habitat for the female to oviposit in. So we see them around Chicagoland all the time. I've only found one pond I'll talk to you later about where it, it, um, it has successfully bred. So of course that's, that migration and that dispersal behavior are, are evolutionary strategies, but, um, but we need to account for this in our monitoring and know, is it really breeding at the site? How about successful of a position? 
is that that we see a female ovipositing that's a really good sign and we need to record that but um is it successful females all the time attempt to oviposit in various realms for example the wandering glider will i i catch her ovipositing every year on the white waxed hood of my forerunner and that's wasted oviposition. They they oviposit in in swimming pools. There's a UV light they use and for for and polarized light they use as a distinction of where to oviposit. So they can get fooled, but they're also randomly ovipositing this particular group. It's been a very successful stratagem for them, but. Um, but that doesn't mean it's actually successful on that site. What about accidentals? We get weather events that blow in species all the time and we count them in our adult monitoring, but it doesn't mean that they are breeding on site. Determining populations is a whole nother thing besides determining species present on site. Resident species, populations of dragonflies is really tough to determine. And with adults, it's almost impossible. And here's why. Adult behavior skew data. You might see a single snake tail out on a rock in a river all day on your monitoring. And you say, wow, this is a very low population. Maybe it needs conservation, but that particular genus is known to have where you see one or two a day and there's hundreds if not thousands roosting in the trees all day long. So adult behavior can really change our perception. When you're trying to count dragonflies, a cruiser like Macromia illinoisensis, it'll patrol an eighth, a quarter mile of river bank. And you stand at that river and you watch it, it flies by your eyes and you count it once and 20 minutes later, here comes another one and it's the same one. So we, we find that transects and walking transects and just counting adults here and there uh, really doesn't inform population. What does for adults is mark and recapture studies, but these are time, labor, and cost intensive and probably not something that a citizen scientist group is going to be able to do. I've never done one, but I will tell you, um, I know uh, several people who have done on various species, one of which is a Heinz Emerald down in, in, in Missouri, and that was a, a successful mark and recapture of population. However, um, it took groups, massive groups of, of people to, to do this over a long period of time to try and get a sense of the population of a single species on a single spot site. So those are problems with monitoring adults. That doesn't mean we stop monitoring adults. We need to always monitor adults. But when, you, but when we do dragonfly monitoring, some of the solutions to the challenges I just met, um, I just stated, uh, we can we can address and we can find solutions to, but well, we need our emphasis to always be on locating successful breeding habitat. That's first and foremost. So with site surveys, we need to monitor adults, nymphs, and exuvi. And it's not necessarily as difficult as it sounds. It sounds like it's going to be way too intensive. We already do adult surveys around the country. And that's what that Odonata Central is about. So when we do adult surveys, recording emergence dates and flight dates is essential, especially now in times of climate change, that first emergence. There are synchronous and asynchronous emergences based on species, but we need to know from year to year what the first flight, when the first flight was, and are we seeing a pattern of change over that? And when was the last flight? We need to record observations of in-cop or, or mating pairs over position sightings and tenorals because if there's a tenoral on your site you know it came from some birth wet wetland or waterway on your site they don't fly far until they're dried out so those are really important for adults but we need to add to these adult surveys we should across northern illinois be doing nymph surveys just to first get an idea of the species assemblages we find and a baseline at each wetland or waterway within a district sites. Um, I do a lot of these in McHenry County and I know where I should expect to find these species from year to year. It involves collecting a single voucher of a final instar nymph at each waterway. And those final instar nymphs can be now identified to species. I work with Ken Tennyson. He is the guru, of course, of North American odonate nymphs.
But it wasn't up until 2019 when he finally published his opus entitled Dragonfly Nymphs of North America and all of the dichotomous keys that he did where we could really effectively and accurately for the very first time identify dragonfly nymphs to species. And we've got that capability now. So, and, and if anybody is interested, if you want any identifications of nymphs and you don't want to spend the time in the lab doing it, if you collect a voucher, I'll do it for you. It's not, it's not a problem. It is, um, it's actually fun. But we need that cataloged and sent down to INHS. Um, note, noting detailed descriptions of the aquatic habitat where that nymph was gotten. And this is why we need to voucher nymphs, because when you dip for nymphs, you know where to find them. And you can then tag this habitat, aquatic habitat and substrate and so forth with this nymph. And that is largely underdone. We need that information. We can do it here in our own backyard. It hasn't been done scientifically for many nymphs, but we are starting just now with the help of identification guides to species to recognize absolute niches not general, not just say this is a riverine species, but where in the river do you find this? Um, so that's important. But I want to emphasize that one thing, even if you don't want to get your feet wet and wade and, and, and um, dip net, one thing that should always be done, and it's the least impactful to the, the, the group of insects and to the environment, are surveys of exuvi. Because exuvi, if you find them on site, you know there was successful breeding. You've got the shed skin and exuvi, you just plop them in water and you ID them to species just like a living nymph. So when we, when we um, survey for exuvi, and Bob Dubois and Ken Tennyson have done a lot of research on this, so we know that it can really not only tell us this is a resident at this site successfully breeding, but we can also use exuvi to the best of our ability for population stats. You have to consider synchronous, asynchronous emergences, but if you've got a species where you've got synchronous emergence and you know it's in the spring, you get out there based on, on, on weather, you keep an eye for the first adult, you do sweeps over the coming days um, away from the water it, and, and multiple sweeps usually for a day will pick up all the exuvi and you start doing that until you see the last tenoral, you've got a population data set. So this is the best assessment for residency and population. Marla, you've got about 10 minutes left. Perfect. You know what, Katie, I'm locked. There we go. I thought it was locked up. So now let's talk about taking the monitoring into conservation. State statuses. Well, I'm, I, I work with Tim Cachette from the State Illinois State Museum and, and Tim Vogt to assist them in developing the ranking system for Illinois. And I'll tell you the ranking system for any, any species, I'm sure you guys know, are fraught with problems. They're much like the global ranking system. We do S1 through S5 and so forth. But I want to talk about the distribution of ranked species in, in Illinois and whether it means that, yeah, it needs to be conserved or, or um, it or it doesn't really give us the information we need to assess whether we need to conserve that species. We'll talk about the factors then affecting the state rank and how ambiguous these rankings can sometimes be. Um, so let's first look at the number of species we see of dragonflies in Illinois uh, as a function of their state rank. And I wanna draw your attention to these S3 through S4 uh, and S5 bars. Anything, you know, we got 34 species, S3, 34, S5. And, and what this means here, S3 to S5, I would say there these are demonstrably secure in the state with no risk of, of extirpation or problems in the in the the future near future. And these up here, state accidental, state historics, we're gonna ignore because we don't even know if they ever bred successfully in the state. But I wanna focus our attention down here to the S1s, S2s, and 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 the federally listed, state listed uh uh, species. And we see primarily here on these two bars, a massive number of species, 23 and 20, 43 species here of Illinois dragonflies that are really only found in a few populations. It means they're either in just a few sites or on the 
if they're on more than a few sites, they are so low in number, which is why the Heinz Emerald, which I'm sure you guys know, is an S2 rather than an S1. Got it on more than the requisite sites for S1, but it's in low numbers on all of those sites, right? So um, let's see what this actually means. Let's start by looking at an S5 species of dragonfly, Plathemus lydia, the common whitetail. I, I know it is a big flaw of mine. I think it's a flaw of humanity to have contempt for what there is too much of. And, and there is a lot of Plathemus. I find this nymph everywhere I dig in every muddy section of every waterway in all of Illinois. It is everywhere. Its nymph has a niche that is broad and it has a dispersal behavior that allows it to create a huge range map, as you see here. At the other end of the pendulum, what do we have? We've got Somatochlora hynena, the Heinz Emerald. It never had a range that was anywhere near Plathemus. It has, it does have some dispersal behavior, but its niche is so niched, so narrow, that you're not gonna find it very, um, very many places. So the, the um, so, so those are the extremes. As far as if you ask me what species have been extirpated from Illinois, there's only been two or three. I, I would say for certain, I'd say there's been two. And they were extirpated over a hundred years ago and they're not coming back. This is one, Gumphorus ventricosis, the skillet club tail. And it, um, I consider it one of the most beautiful club tails we have. You can see that broad skillet at the end of its abdomen. It is a very sensitive nymph. Its nymph likes good, clean water, not silted in. And our very first um, Illinois state entomologist, his name was Benjamin Dan Walsh. He was a colleague actually over in Cambridge of Charles Darwin. Um, but in 19, 1838, he moved to Northwestern Illinois in Rock Falls, Illinois. And he started collecting insects and he collected the holotype for the species description. And he described it in 1862 from Illinois. And we find that he described a lot of species from here in Illinois. This one was present and breeding, no doubt about it, along the Mississippi River here. But the Mississippi got channeled, things got silted in, it's never going back. And now you see it is only spotty in a few areas way north. Um, so that's been extirpated. But there are times when we rank something like the Ophiogonphus repensilensis. This is another one Dan Walsh described in the 1800s from Illinois. This rusty snake tail has, look, look on the, the adults. The adults are only, have only been recorded in two places. The Winnebago um, Dragonfly Monitoring Network found an adult up here and I found one down here. It, they were known historically through there. And so it's got a really low state rank, but that doesn't actually reflect its uh, sustainability in the state because I'll tell you, once I started looking for its nymphs and finding it, I started looking in those specific spots in, in midstream under, um, under uh, gravel in the Kishwaukee, the Vermilion River, uh, the Pecatonica. And what, what you find is that these nymphs are actually plentiful. So again, population is difficult to know. Um, I wanna talk about the Comet Darner very quickly, and then I'll finish up. Anax longipes is the Comet Darner. It's got a fire engine red abdomen. This is a tenoral here. It's still filling in with color. Uh, it, it, it flies, as I mentioned before in this talk, over wetlands and, and, and ponds, and it's always uh, an eye splasher to, to, to see it and record it, but it doesn't mean it's breeding on site. In fact, it requires, its nymph requires a really heavy, um, shallow and well-vegetated wetland without fish. And I did find a, a population, these are all adults, but I found a nymph population right up here on the um, in, in northeastern Illinois at a glacial pond. It was the pond with the richest odinate fauna I'd ever found in Chicagoland, and it was because it was fishless. And um, what happened was I monitored this for six years, and I discovered that the adult female was ovipositing in the Phragmites 
stems that were falling in the water, soaking up with water and, and floating, and it made perfect of a position material. There was lotus in this area, in, in the pond. There was all sorts of subaquatic and emergent vegetation, including cattails. And its nymphs undoubtedly were, were, were feeding on the massive damselfly nymphs that, were, that I found in this pond. I've never seen more damselfly nymphs by the hundreds, literally, when I would do a single dip net. Two things happened. Crayfish got in there. I think it's the rusty, but I'm not good with crayfish. Um, but I'm pretty certain it's rusty because the crayfish just exploded and the aquatic vegetation became depauperate for that reason. And also they sprayed the Phragmites and the cattails and they disappeared. And in just the last two years, I can find almost nothing in that pond. So I know we're worried about Phragmites, but it was actually being used by this species successfully. And it was going through, I found exuvi like crazy. And now I find nothing. This comet darner doesn't exist in that pond anymore. It's gonna have to recolonize it hopefully later. All right, so I'm finishing up here. Factors affecting state rate then in summary, the, whether it's on the edge of the natural distribution of the range, it may just be a Northern species and Northern Illinois is just where it comes down. So we wouldn't expect it anywhere else. It's migration, colonization, expansion and climate change we're seeing all the time. There's certain species of damselflies that are moving into Chicago from the Southwest, for example. Um, other behaviors and incomplete adult surveys uh, affect our, our state ranking, the scarcity of habitat, it may naturally be a scarce habitat in Illinois. So it might not be something that, that as long as where it's at is protected, we have to worry about it. What we're concerned about is human disturbance. And this is huge. There are hydrologic changes and drainage of, of, of aquifers and so forth that are playing a huge role in affecting and impacting what species are present and the populations of the species present cooling lakes for nuclear power plants like in Braidwood, Morris. Uh, just in the last two years, they found a southern species of damselfly that's a nymph is overwintering in those warm, those lakes that are warmed by the nuclear power plant cooling um, cylinders. And so now it's surviving there and breeding. Trafficking and hijacking. I found a species from Texas in, in the Vermilion River. And um, and I'm, I'm pretty certain it came from the fishery in Ottawa. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to be able to successfully live there as, as things warm up. Fish stocking for sportsmen and recreational fishing is, is huge. Rusty crayfish absolutely destroy dragonfly populations. Um, go to Trout Lake in Wisconsin if you want to see what a rusty crayfish has done to the vegetation and the, the dragonfly populations. Conservation, general strategies, and I'm done. What should we do in general that should be safe? Leave ponds and shorelines well vegetated. They need, these dragonflies need perches as they emerge. Don't mow up to the edge like they do it every, I've lived in a town home for, I lived in a town home for many, many years. They always mowed right up to that detention basin. What a shame. Um, and that destroys the damselfly population, which then in turn um, destroys the, the dragonfly population because dragonfly nymphs, eat direct damselfly nymphs. Um, and, and plant native aquatics and emergence as, you can, as possible. Make no wake zones along rivers and streams. Make sure you maintain at least a section of un, undisturbed shorelines, even shorelines where you're not going to burn up to because ash destroys dragonfly nymph populations and streams and, and um, other waterways. So always leave an area that is undisturbed or unburnt so that we, we can um, recolonize from those sections. Don't stock ponds with fish if you can help it. I know there's a call to do that. Um, and uh, especially black basses and centrarchid fish, a lot of, of good dragonflies are, their nymphs are susceptible to those. Don't channel streams, obviously, or, and stabilize banks against flash. Remove tiles. You guys all know this. Uh, don't drain lands. Trying to prevent salt runoff because our species are not able to grow in brackish water or, or salty water. And we've got a lot of salt in Chicago land running off our roads. So with that, I just want to acknowledge um, Ken Tennyson is, uh, is, is my mentor, my teacher, and one of my very best friends. And if it weren't for him, I would know nothing at all about dragonfly nymphs. So I want to say thank you to him. Steve Valley is also my mentor and, and one of my very best friends. And he is a, um, an entomological image specialist. He has taught me 
everything I need to know about photography for stacking for, for um, my needs. And uh, he actually photographed those dragonfly eyes on one of the one of the slides I showed. Bill Smith is retired from the WDNR and, and he has taught me amazing amounts of aquatic uh, aquatic biology, which I need, and the botany, uh, which I need to understand nymphs better. And of course, um, Carlos Garrison, whom is an extraordinary field buddy and partner for life. So thank you so much. And I will take any questions if we have any time, Katie.